It's already muted. You can open that or wait until we're ready. Well, wait okay. for what? Till we get your, okay, you're already muted. I'm already okay. muted. Okay, great. I'm going to go ahead and get the okay. feed off. And then I'll wait for you to come back okay. before. Are you seeing it? Mm -hmm. okay. um, I might not have it on the libraries. You can. Got it on yours. Here's the link. You have a copy of the book? What do you think? Should we go? Just a second. Okay. Just a second. You can go ahead. This book. All right. Hello, and welcome to Reading for Life. If this is your first time with us, welcome. The purpose of Reading for Life is to grow community around a shared love of literature. The core idea is that works of literature offer precious resources of energy and vision for the creation and sustenance of healthy communities. Reading for Life leverages this unique resource to grow community from the inside out, to link imagination to imagination in an ongoing conversation about the concerns we share and the aspirations we harbor. It's educational and entertaining in the richest sense of both terms, a living classroom as wide and as deep as our collective spirit can imagine. My name is Julie Kleinfelter. I'm the director at the Austin Public Library in Minnesota, and I'm your host today. Our presenter is Michael Verde, 
Michael graduated with honors from the University of Texas's Plan to Honors program, earned a master's degree in literature studies from the University of Iowa, and another in theology from the University of Durham, England, where he graduated at the top of his international class. He taught for 15 years at the university and college prep school levels, most recently at Indiana University, and is currently completing his PhD with a focus on literature and religion. Michael founded Reading for Life in 2005. Today, we'll be talking about the book, The Catcher in the Rye by J.D. Salinger. And <clears throat> Michael, um, as I was reading through this, I, I know well, you and I have spent some time together doing this now. So we've done, this is I think our ninth book together. And one thing that I know I should always be paying attention to is names. So the name of the main character in this book is Holden Caulfield. And I thought that might be a good place for us to start today. Um, you know, obviously Holden makes me think about holding on to things. So there's some, obviously some things that maybe Holden is holding on to, um, but maybe we could start there with some of this conversation. Well, yeah, let's do that. And that, that's a great place to start. But before, even in your introduction, you use a phrase where we can find each other, can go back to that part where you find each other in great works of literature. That is a really, really telling phrase. Can you read that again? Uh, <laughs> re, re, uh, the unique resource for growing community, linking imagination to imagination in an ongoing conversation about the concerns we share and the aspirations we harbor. Um, and then just the living classroom as wide and as deep as our collective spirit can imagine. And a little bit before that, you say we find each other in works of literature. Uh, growing community around a shared love of literature. I should have read this to you before we started. I'm no, not sure well, anyway, you're coming to it. No, well, listen, let, here, let's, let's focus into this. The idea that we could find each other in works of literature, maybe my imagination is doing that, which would suggest that maybe we're not finding each other outside of works of literature. I mean, it's the kind of idea that if we're reading together at a certain kind of imaginative intensity, that we can get to know each other in ways that we might not if we were just, let's say, in the workplace and or even if casual conversation and social settings, that there's something about works of literature that if we read it together, we could discover parts of ourselves that we might not elsewhere. In other words, literature is serving us in a role here of facilitating a kind of conversation in which something authentic about ourselves comes out and that we connect with each other through this sharing something of substance. You can imagine that we could share stuff that was uh, superficial, that we wouldn't really connect us deeply. But if we share something authentic, something from coming where deep inside, and we you find something in me coming from deep inside, and I discover something from you deep inside, then that is binding us together in a way that might not through other kinds of media. And I'm leaning into this because this book is called The Catcher and the Rye, which suggests that this book is trying to catch something. I mean, we could just, just begin with that, that there's a, something that about us that can be caught or it can be missed. And you can imagine any conversation between two people, if it's a meaningless conversation or if both people's personas have sort of uh, uh, taken over, their what is authentic about them, then in a way people are missing each other. And throughout this novel, almost every conversation Holden has with somebody, they're missing each other. Either because he's put on a persona, he's called himself Jim Steele, he's made up a, a name uh, of himself as a kind of a character because he doesn't want to give the person his real name, or it's just because the conversation is so, as he says, phony, that there's not a real connection. So in any case, I want to keep that in mind here. And we, let's go back now to the thing about Holden Caulfield. Well, first of all, Holden, I think that it does sound uh, Holden, like something we're holding. And if you combine that with Catcher in the Rye, uh, you, you've got Holden, a hand that would catch something that might be missed. For instance, 
A catcher also has, a, there's a mitt. His, you know, his brother died, Alley. He had a mitt and he was out. Uh, and, and on his mitt, he wrote poems on the fingers of the mitt. Now think about this as an image. There's poems and he specifies that these poems are written on the fingers of the mitt. Now that suggests that there's some connection. This is what we're just talking about with the idea of catching something in poetry. In other words, these poems can catch us. We're reading this poem and something in us that usually is missed comes out and the poem catches it. You get, I mean, anyone who's had a, a powerful work of literature knows, oh my, oh my goodness, this, this story, all of a sudden I realized something about myself. It caught something in me that maybe my neighbors didn't, maybe even my good friends or the people at work. So already now you can see that there's something going on with catching and holding. Now you can imagine holding being a po positive thing. If, a, like he says, if a, what's he going to be, a catcher in the rye? If these children are running through the rye and they're going to go off the cliff and he holds them, well, that's a positive thing. But you could also imagine holding on to something that you won't let go of that in a sense has frozen you. I can think for just off the, from just the plot here that Holden's The Death of Allie is a moment when something had him had him happened to him traumatically. In fact, the first time that he went to a psychiatrist or a psychoanalyst or a therapist is at the death of Allie. Now that's important because this whole book, he's at a place where people go when they run down and he has been talking to a therapist. He's telling us something while he's at this place that he's gone when he is run down. In other words, this is this story that he's talking is almost, you can imagine, with some kind of asylum where a madman goes, I'm using an expression he uses, and he's talking to people and he's trying to get something to come out. You can even think of therapy. You're trying to talk with somebody that you trust so deeply that something comes out authentic. You've been living this life with a certain persona, and this persona is keeping you disconnected from other people, but you have this relationship with a therapist that you can trust, and the next thing you know, something comes out of you that's real, and the two of you are kind of can acknowledge that and recognize it, and then all of a sudden, that thing that come out is something now that can be you instead of the persona that you brought into therapy. Well, you imagine that a book could do the kind of same thing. In fact, you can see that Holden's not wild about psychoanalysts. And in a sense, he's sort of saying, listen, all that head stuff is not nearly as powerful as literature. In fact, that head stuff can even take you away from things that literature can take you into. And very specifically, what that, what that head stuff can do, if it gets too heady, is disconnect you from your own body. Now, we're still going to get back to this Holden Caulfield, but I just want to attach this Holden now as a positive or a negative, depending on the circumstances. Uh, let, let, let's, let's, so just hang on the hold. Let's go to Caulfield. Well, first of all, you know, Caulfield, a call is what a baby's born with and it comes out. And I think, I don't know a lot about bio biology here, but the amniotic sac is still over the baby's face. It's, that's a baby that's born with a call. Well, that's you can imagine then something o o over a face. And then you can imagine then that this sac or this call, it holding himself is held inside the call. I mean, you almost have to be twice born if you're born, born with a call. You got you got to come out of your mother, and then you got to come out of the call. So something coming out of something is a big deal in this novel. And if it comes out and you catch it, well, there you go. But if it comes out and you miss it, well, it disappears. So we're playing around with this imagery. But what's important about what we're doing is is that we're paying attention to those words. If you just read. Well, and then call a field. You can imagine a field. Now, we're using our imagination. There's no right answer like in the math. In the math, you can go to the back of the book and see what that A equals means. But that isn't that the kind of thing here. But your, your imagination can play with these images in a way that is more or less generative. In other words, you could just start making stuff up that doesn't relate to the book. And then the book doesn't kind of come together in a way that's that knocks you out. There, you know, this is a phrase that Holden's always using. When he dances with Bernice, she could really knock him out. Well, there you go. But something that was in that needed to be knocked out. You remember the scene with the three girls at the club and the one named Bernice could really dance. Now, she was a bore. And when she talked, it, it killed things. But when she danced. Now, how about that for an image of two people connecting? We're talking about things catching things. 
two people dancing in such a way. He says, you know, when the dancing's really good is when I, that part, he, she's telling her this and she's not interested in this conversation because it's messing up the dancing. But anyway, she, he says, when this little part of me that's on the back, on your back, when I can't feel anything underneath it, that's when the dancing's really good. Another way of saying that is when we're dancing now, we are connecting so deeply that two bodies are becoming one. And both of us are moving to the music. We're not psychoanalyzing each other. We're not having a phony conversation. We're not talking at all. We're dancing, but we're communicating. Now, these are all very important terms, communicating, communion. Communion. What is communion? Now, the reason I'm saying this is this novel is set around Christmas time. You couldn't imagine a more sort of symbolically important time of the year. In some ways, certainly in one tradition, Christmas is when, of course, Christ is born. And Christmas Mass. Mass is also the, 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 what you do when you go to the, the church and you take a, your bread. Speaking of rye, you take the bread. And then you eat the bread, you put that, okay, you can imagine communion being something that happens between two people. Um, we're feeding each other now because we're talking in a way that's real. Or you could imagine communion as being something that takes place with yourself in a book, where there's something in the book that's of substance that you're taking in. But you could also imagine those things being missed because we're phonies or because we're, in this case, disconnected from our own bodies. And that's what I was saying in a sense. You can imagine Holden is cut off from his body in the sense that he can't feel. He's talking a lot. He's very cerebral. He's analyzing, you know, he's, he's living, let's say, from the neck up. But it's from the neck down that it's, that's got him, in a sense, uh, not being able to connect with other people. He's not being able to connect with himself. So a big part of, of you could say, is holding, is, is being able to hold another person, not miss them, coming out of, of this thing that we're trapped into. You could say we're trapped in a, in a superficial culture or we're trapped into the nonsense phoniness that we've internalized from TV or from our friends at school or from the adults in our life. You know how he describes, what is it, uh, Mr. Ossenberger, who is the headmaster, who, I don't know, Ossenberger actually might be the, the funeral, the guy that has a funeral home, but he's going to give him a speech. He's going to give him a talk, and he starts telling them all about this successful sort of stuff in the, the chapel, and his friend Marsala, what would be the word flatulence? I don't I want to say this sort of properly. One of his friends, he says, cuts one, okay? Now, talking about a symbol of somebody being full of it, okay? So what's happening, these kids are being preached to with a bunch of nonsense. And that's, that's in other words, you could be trapped into that. This is what these adults are doing in a way is feeding these kids a bunch of bull. And if those kids grow up and try to live it out, well, they lose themselves. So coming out of that, coming out of the hot air is part of what would be to be like born again. You come out of your mother once, but then you come out of this cultural sort of amniotic sac or this call that's around you. That's one way to imagine it. There's not a single way, you know, Holden is preoccupied with people's faces. He gives the scene where uh, he, he's in this kind of cheap hotel and he looks out the, you can see people in other hotel and these are men and a woman and they're both squirting. Uh, they take a sip of, of water and they squirt it on each other's face. And this really sort of bothering him that they're squirting this on each other's face. Now, there's a lot of stuff going on, the kind of sexuality stuff that you wouldn't, that you're supposed to keep behind closed doors, things about ourselves that we wouldn't. But also there's something about, are they really being intimate in a way? Are they making love in a way that's mutually meaningful? Or are they missing each other because the, the they're, they're sort of using each other as objects, et cetera? But this is a big deal. Do we connect? All right, so with all that kind of in mind, we're just going to keep an eye on these other words the way we did call field. But you can imagine a, a call around the whole field, in which case the whole world, there's a whole world that needs to come out of something, that a world needs to be born out of something. This is scratching the surface kind of stuff. 
uh, that's super sort of cool. But let's start here with what he says about Pensy because Pensy's a place he's leaving. With our whole, okay, so he leaves Pensy. And what does he say about Pensy? And this will sort of set the stage here. He says at Pensy, you either froze to death or you died of the heat. So we've been talking about a nature here, and I want to say here that what makes it difficult to touch in a mutually beneficial way, so two people have genuine communion, is you got to get the temperature right. If it's too hot, you touch each other, but somebody gets hurt. You remember the scene where he's in the, the can with Stradlator and Stradlator's brushing his teeth and it's all steamy. And Stradlator, he's upset with Stradlator because Stradlator has maybe been with Jane in a way that he thinks maybe they had sex and that he's, and Stradlator doesn't even know her name is Jane. It's Jean. Okay, so there is an example of something too hot. Let's say they did have sex but they didn't make love. I'm using these terms because the book really does. Stradlater, he's fearful, has had sex with Jane, and he thinks Jane's name is Jean, which means he's had sex with her, but he didn't know her. And this is bugging him because he thinks he knows Jane. In fact, he feels like he knows. How well does he know Jane? He says, I knew her like a book. Now, this should tell you something about the potential of knowing a book in, in the same way that we're talking about here, intimacy between two persons. How intimate could you know a book? You could know a book like a person. You could know a person like a book. In any case, he's so upset with Stradlater. He tries to punch him. He tries to punch him in the toothbrush. Okay, now that it's a steamy room. That's too hot. Okay, that's too hot in there. They're not connecting. You can imagine, in other words, a certain heat being violence. Or you could imagine heat as being potentially positive. If something is super cold, you might need to heat it up. But if it gets too hot, it turns to steam. Now, I'm playing with these images, not because I'm particularly preoccupied with them or I think this is super clever. I'm Hopefully, I'm playing with the images that the novel's playing with. And this is a big thing here. We're not trying to psychoanalyze the book. That would be what Holden would make fun of. You know, you're trying to cycle in and then, then it's in my head. I'm trying to actually hear what the book is communicating through images. If it's too cold, then you can't touch because you can't feel. Now, think about the opening scene. What is the opening scene? It's Holden on a snowy day. How is Holden related to his classmates or his, well, he's not. He's up on a hill looking down on him on the snow, on the snow, and his hands are frozen because he can't find his fur-lined gloves. So his hands are frozen. He goes to meet old Spencer, his, his teacher, his English teacher, or excuse me, I believe that old Spencer is his history teacher. Old his, Spencer is, okay. And he says on page eight, this is really something incredible. He's going to meet, he's going to tell by, old Mr. Spencer by, he's standing, he's knocking on the door, he's outside of the door, and he says, boy, I rang that doorbell fast when I got to old Spencer's house. Then the next sentence, I was really frozen. Now, on the surface, we could read that, and he was just saying, boy, was I really cold. But if we're paying attention so that we don't miss something, what does that sentence say? I was really frozen. In other words, I'm frozen. This is Holden. He begins the novel frozen. He is isolated. And specifically, he says, my, his thing, he says, my ears were hurting, which would suggest something about hearing. And I could hardly move my fingers at all. You're not going to catch something if you can't move your fingers at all. And and he also connects his not being able to make a fist because when his brother Allie died, he put he's punching out the, the windows in the garage. He wounds his fist and he can't really make a fist. You asked, we talked, we're talking about holding here. What he might be holding on might have something to do with whatever feelings got traumatized when Allie died. I don't know. We don't want to psychoanalyze the book, but something happened when Allie died that all of a sudden now he's disconnected from his own body. And you could imagine if the brother that you love died 
you might not be real wild about, let's say, things that are changing. The world is dangerous. The world can take away something that you love. And one way to deal with that is I'm just not going to feel. Now, the downside of that, of course, is that you don't feel. In a way, we're getting to the real dynamic of the novel here. Holden has to learn how you can risk touching, which is to say feeling, in a world where things are imperfect. And isn't this what he can't accept? Isn't this why he loves the Natural History Museum? Because everything is exactly where it was the last time you went there. Nothing changes. Nobody dies. None of those Indians or Eskimos die. The downside is they're not real. And, and so this is really kind of Holden's dilemma. How do you live in a world? He goes to he goes to Phoebe's school and he sees written on the on the on the staircase there the word F-U-C-K, and he wants to rub them all out. And then he, he gets to one that's been etched in there so that it's not just ink. It's actually carved in, and he can't rub it out. And then he thinks that some days if someone's going to do that to my tombstone, they're going to have my name. And then the last thing is going to be his F-U. He doesn't want to live in a world like that. And yet part of him coming out is realizing that those are the terms of being alive. Those are the terms of loving. We're going to live on a, in a world where there, we'll never be able to erase all the FUs. We'll never be able to keep little brothers from dying accidentally. Now, this is really kind of getting back to this call field uh, and being able to see something face to face without being covered. So that's coming out. This is meeting each other in a moment of intimacy. As soon as you do that, you risk being hurt. You also risk being missed. So do I really show you my face? And this is what this is the question of intimacy, isn't it? Is it too hot or too cold? If it if the temperature's not right, you're not gonna touch me and I'm not gonna touch you, or we're gonna touch each other in a way that's hurtful. Or one person's not gonna feel anything and the other person's gonna use them like an object, which is kind of what he's afraid is gonna happen with Stradlator and Gene, right? One of the things that happens with Jean, Jane, excuse me, Stradlater calls her Jean. What happens with Jane is they go to a movie and she touches him on the neck. He mentioned just out of the blue, this young girl touches him on the neck. And he says, that really knocked me out. That really knocked me out. Well, that was a moment, a kind of a profound intimacy. When this thing that he was holding into, let's say he's holding in his uh I don't know, fear, or he's holding, he doesn't want to risk being touched, something that he's holding on to, that knocked him out. All of a sudden, he's outside of that call. He's outside of that thing he's holding on to, and he's experiencing intimacy. Just briefly. In a way, the whole novel is really good. How do I get the temp how do we get the temperature right between the two of us? And then the imagery of the novel now, all of a sudden, it matters if the bathroom is steamy. Now, let's consider this book, is, the wordplay of this book is so sophisticated. I, I mean, every book we talked about is sophisticated wordplay. That's really what literature is, sophisticated word Playing with words in such a way that something comes out of the words. I mean, play here is the highest sort of achievement. You can imagine, what is Bach doing? He's just playing the piano. Yeah, that's all he's doing. He's playing the piano. But if you play the piano right, or if you play the piano with enough intensity, something comes out in the music that is both natural and also eternal in a way. It's artistically transmuted, but all you were doing was playing. So really, I'm just saying, what is a novel doing? It's playing with words, but playing with words so intensely that something comes out of the words that you, let's say, is so real that it never does. But you'd have to have a reader that caught it, which means you'd have to have a reader that's paying attention. And you'd have to have a reader that was able to, to risk feeling and not just reading from the neck up. If you read from the neck up, you're reading like a psychoanalyst, or you might even be reading like a literature teacher who, who's trying to analyze everything. But if you read with your whole body, then those images start moving. It starts moving your imagination, which is different than your intellect. You've seen what I mean? In a sense, our imagination is the way our whole body thinks. Our intellect is how we think from the neck up. Well, literature 
is when our whole is, is a communication involves our whole body. That's how it's different than philosophy or theology or sociology. Those things can move us from the neck up. They're intellectual. Works of literature, they're intelligent, but it's an intelligence that includes our whole body. And this is what images do. The images speak to our whole body. We can't make sense of them from the neck up, or we could, but we won't touch the book. So let's take a couple of just like quintessential sort of things. You, you started one Holden's name, but here's another one. Where do the ducks go in Central Park when it freezes? Now, this, this is what Holden's want to know. Where do the ducks go? Now, we just mentioned that Holden is really frozen. So let's think about this just for a second. If Holden is really frozen and he's preoccupied with what the ducks, where the ducks go when the pond freezes over. You can imagine that what Holden's really concerned about is what happens to me when everything inside of me freezes? Where do I go? So in some sense, the ducks, you could say, are kind of, this is kind of how he's seeing himself indirectly. He, this is his own situation that he's preoccupied about. Why does it matter that it's Central Park? Well, just imagistically, uh, one, it's a park, which is nature, called Field. Field is nature. This book is dedicated to my mother. He says, dedicated to my mother. We can think of that as your biological mother, but you can also think of his mother nature. This, this in, in many ways, Holden's cut off from his own nature. In other words, his intellect, you might say, has frozen his nature. He needs to get back to his mother, mother nature. Okay, okay. So in any case, this book is really playing around with nature. And you can imagine that he is of the central part. That's a field. And it's central in a sense, maybe like the heart of it all. At the heart of this place is water that's frozen. And I want to know what happens to living things when these things like Allie's death come around. You see that that freezes that heart is something like out. What happens to me when my little brother dies and my, and my heart, my feelings freeze. Now this is an interesting conversation. So let's consider that just as a kind of image. Is that, is that the answer in the back of the book? No, this is me trying to tune in to the Salinger's imagery here. Okay. So this is, so, he's going to, have a conversation with the second cab driver that he asked about these ducks when the second cab driver. The second cab driver is named Horvitz. And since I know that every name in here, like any every word in here is potentially has a, a, a meaning to it that is a, a symbol, I just look these names up, okay? So Horvitz happens to be a name of people that come from a particular location in Czech where many of the people that come from there are rabbis. They come from the line of Levites, and this was the line of the tribes of, of, of Judah, of Israel, that God chose the Levites, and they're like the priest. They're the priestly. In fact, they were assistants to the priests, the Levites. But the Levites, in a sense, are a kind of privileged messenger within the tribes of Israel. Why does this matter? Because old Horvitz, the interaction with with Salon, with excuse me, Holden, and Horvitz is almost like an interaction between a very lost young man and a very unusual kind of rabbi. Rabbi means teacher. So let's tune in to, to, in, into this because this conversation, when we hear the subtext, it's really amazing what's being communicated here subtextually. Anyway, he says, I struck up a conversation. His name was Horvitz. He was a much better guy than the other driver I had. Anyway, I thought maybe he might know about the ducks. Hey, Horvitz, I said, you ever pass by the lagoon in Central Park down by Central Park South? The what? The lagoon, that little lake there, like where the ducks are, you know? Yeah, what about it? Well, you know the ducks that swim around in it. Now, around, this, he uses his words a lot, often with the phrase horsing around. Now, I'm jumping around here because these images keep sparking different things. Well, you know the novel ends with a horse going around and around, right? The merry-go-round. So horsing around is a big deal. You know the way of saying this is nature goes around and around. Horse is nature. It goes around and around. And if 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 we if, if nothing comes out of that, we're just going to go around and around and die. 
so we want to go around and around, but we want to make something that, that, that we catch that isn't going to die. But we don't want to lose touch with nature. This is a complicated thing. You could say that you can imagine some religious people saying, well, when you get to heaven, things will be blah, blah, blah. In a way, you're rejecting your own body by saying this world doesn't really matter now. It'll be real when we get there. Well, what about what's real right here? In other words, this book is saying that our wholeness, our being be able to feel involves us being reconnected to our nature in a way that we won't be if our head's in a call or we're going to be disconnected from nature. If we've internalized all of this nonsense phoniness, we get cut off from our own body. You can even imagine advertisements. What are advertisements in a way? They're just really sophisticated ways to make you feel insecure about your own body. And that the only way you can be lovable is if you buy a product and use this skin cream or have a car this fancy so that a girl will love you. In other words, the, our whole culture in many ways is kind of disconnecting us from our nature. It could also be disconnecting us from works of literature too, because ideally literature is not trying to do what an advertisement does. An advertisement is feeding on us. We like to think that something in the world is feeding us and not just feeding on us. Well, that of course brings us all back to communion and, uh, and mass. This all takes place around Christmas. Okay. So in any case, he's, wants to say, well, the ducks that swim around in it, the springtime and all, do you happen to know where they go in the winter time by any chance? Horvitz, where who goes? And he didn't say what, he said who, which is very interesting. So now these animals are kind of been personified because really that's what we're, we're really talking about who is holding here, right? So this is a wisdom just playing with the word where who goes? The ducks, do you know by any chance? I mean, does somebody... And I'm stressing that because this book plays around with somebody, nobody, everybody. There's a lot of bodies. And nobody is a big word in this book because, in a way, Holden doesn't have a body. He's lost his body. He's no body until he gets his body back. He's like a walking voice, in a way. Anyway, somebody come around in a truck or something and take them away? Or do they fly away by themselves, go south or something? Oh, Horvitz turned all the way around. There's that word around again. He turned all the way around and looked at me. He was a very impatient type guy. He wasn't a bad guy, though. How the hell should I know? He said, this is a very unlikely rabbi, okay? How the hell should I know a stupid thing like that? Well, don't get sore about it. Sore would be if someone touched you too hard. You'd get sore. We're trying to get intimacy, not we want something that doesn't leave us sore in a way. Okay. Well, don't get sore about it. I said he was sore about it or something. Who's sore? Nobody's sore. Listen to that. Nobody's sore. The paradox of that is you're sore because you have no body. You see, Holden's hurting because you're disconnected from your body nobody's sore. This is just wordplay here. What's wrong with Holden? He's lost his body because he doesn't want to feel. If you have a body, you're going to feel. Your little brother's going to die and it's not going to be bearable. So you disassociate from your body. This is a way to think about it. I'm saying this one because in page eight, it says I was really frozen. Okay. You can't just, you can't just say Holden's frozen because you think it's clever. There's a phrase that says I was really frozen. So that's different than analyzing the book. You're listening to the book. Okay. I stopped having a conversation with him. If he's going to get so damn touchy, it's about touching people. Can we touch each other? Okay. What does he say about his parents? I'm not going to tell you all this David Copperfield kind of crap because my parents are touchy as hell. Touchy as hell is a pretty interesting phrase, right? I don't think hell being too touchy, or if it is touchy, it wouldn't be the kind of touch you'd want because it would burn you. Touchy as hell, in other words, is not so great. Neither would be touchy as frozen so great. We need to get a different kind of touchy. Uh, interestingly enough, he's the manager of the fencing team. And what do you do in fencing? Touche. It's French for a touch. Also interesting, why is he the manager of the fencing team? He could have been a manager of the basketball team. Fencing team? Well, what does you do when you fence? You got a little thing over your face, too. That's like a call. Now, this is how the book speaks in images. It's not coming out and saying, here's the meaning of this book. You should. These are speaking in images, but either we're tuned into it or we're not. We're allowing it to get a word in edgewise. We're allowing it to touch us and not miss it. 
Okay. So he got so damn touchy about it, but he started it up again himself. He turned all the way around again. There's that word around. Around another way, another word for around in the Greek word is metanoia. It means turning your mind around. It's the same word for redemption, incidentally. It's when you change your mind. Something happens and all of a sudden you see things differently. So the, that's partly what's going on when he turns all around again. I mean, turning around again is like being saved in a way. Your mind changes. It's turned. That's what the word metanoia means. In any case, he turned all the way around again and said, the fish, now here you go, the fish don't go no place. Now we're imagine now this is, you can imagine a rabbi giving some counsel, spiritual counsel to a kid who's wondering what happens to me now that I'm frozen. Okay. And you can imagine there's some unlikely counsel. The fish don't go no place. Now you remember Holden's always thinking he's going to run away. He's going to go out West. He's going to worry. He's going to have a filling station and not talk to people and fill up their cars. Okay. That means he's running away. What's he doing from Pensy? He's running away. But what does old Horvitz say about the fish? They don't go no place. He's getting some wisdom right here. They stay right where they are, the fish. Right in the goddamn lake. The fish, that's different, Holden says. The fish is different. I'm talking about the ducks. What's different about it? This is Horvitz. Nothing's different about it, Horvitz said. Everything he said, he sounded sore about something. It's tougher for the fish, the winner and all. This is so amazing. Then it is for the ducks, for Christ's sake. Now you can tell me or not whether the Christ's sake matters here or not. Okay. It's different. Is what's it different? It's harder for the fish than it is for ducks, for Christ's sake. Use your head for Christ's sake. Uh, you can play around with that sentence all day. How do you use your head? You could use it for your sake. You could use it for your headmaster's sake. You could use it for your superficial mom's sake, or you could use it for Christ's sake. It's your head. Okay. I didn't say anything for about a minute. Then I said, all right, what do they do? The fish and all. The fish and all. We're talking about all living things when it freezes. When that whole little lake's a solid block of ice, People skating on it and all. Now think about that if you're if Holden's talking about himself. That people are skating on him, which is to say they're on the surface. Nobody's penetrating. He's frozen beneath these people skating all over him. They're just words. There's nothing penetrating. Okay, this is the subtext here, but we're missing it if we're not following the images. Okay, like there's a solid block of ice, people skating up. Whole Horvitz turned around again. If you didn't get it, how many times he's turning around, uh, this novel, it won't be the novel's fault. What the hell you mean? What do they do? He yelled at me. They stay right where they are for Christ's sake. If you didn't get the first Christ's sake, here's the second. Okay. They stay right where they are for Christ's sake. Now, what's interesting here is because both nature and Christ are positive in this scene. Okay. And that what's interesting about that, that suggests that Christ isn't other than nature. In, in other words, finding Christ isn't mean cutting yourself off from your body. We've talked about this in quite a few books, that the spirit and the body are actually not two different things. You know, in some versions of Christianity, the spirit is the pure thing that's not the body. But and not a single work of literature has any book endorsed the idea that the spirit is separate than the body. In every work of literature, uh, from the things they carried to the Song of Solomon, Jane Eyre, every single one of those books we discuss, the spiritual is found when the body is integrated into the imagination. It's not rejecting the body. In fact, you could even say one of the great things about Jane Eyre is this is a theology of, uh, coming through a novel written by a woman. It's basically saying all you men preachers, they keep talking about the body as it's a bad thing. Indirectly, what's the impact on women? If a woman is associated with her body and a body is sin, this is a real, let's say, a theology that sacrifices women. You got to sacrifice your body to get to heaven. Well, I'm saying all this because Horvitz is suggesting, uh, no, that's not. this is not how you, you live when winter comes, by sacrificing your body. Okay. They stay right where they are for Christ's sake. And then Holden says, they can't just ignore the ice, because maybe that's what Holden's trying to do. 
They can't just ignore it. Who's ignoring it? Nobody's ignoring it. Now, this is a, who's ignoring it? This is almost like asking Holden, are you ignoring it? Nobody's ignoring The body's not ignoring it. This is the way to think it. The body, the, nobody's ignoring it. Or you can think of a, no, no one has a body because they're ignoring the na nature world. Okay. Horvitz, he got so damn excited in all. Excited is when molecules heat up, which if something's frozen, you want to do. Sound your love, Fitzgerald. He talks about it in this book, The Great Gatsby is one of his favorite books. The Great Gatsby was all about, uh, exciting in The Great Gatsby is all about things getting heated so two people don't miss each other, like Gatsby doesn't want to miss Daisy. In any case, I'm just saying that Salinger read The Great Gatsby, picked up on this theme of missing or not missing. What is Gatsby, what is Nick goes out east to be a bondsman, and he says these are all careless people. In other words, nobody's bonded out east. Okay, to be bonded is to not miss each other. Salinger picked up on that in The Great Gatsby, and you can see it coming alive here. This is how these great artists talk to each other. But they. this is why I asked you earlier about finding each other in literature. You could say that the imaginations of Salinger found the imagination of Fitzgerald in Fitzgerald's The Great Gatsby. Do you see what I mean? He read The Great Gatsby, and he found an imagination that caught him. He got caught by Fitzgerald. Fitzgerald was the catcher of his imagination in a world that was phony. This is these artists, in other words, they're they're catching each other's imaginations and they're passing on the favor. Do you see what I mean? Fitz, now Salinger's going to catch somebody else's imagination, hopefully ours. In a world where we got a lot of people talking nonsense to us, we can read this book and all of a sudden something has caught us that ain't nonsense. This is, I think, what your introduction, that's why I uh, was perseverating on it. Okay, he got so, I was afraid he was going to drive the cab right into a lamppost or something. Now, isn't that ironic? Because that would be the light. If he got so excited that he drove in the lamppost, he'd get so excited that they were, light would come. Phoebe, his sister's name, Phoebe comes from Phoebe Apollo, Phoebus Apollo, the sun god. So the light, you want to get the right light. So this is, none of this, it, did he intend that? Did Salinger intend it or did Salinger's imagination intend it? Those are two different things. I don't know if Salinger, the human, but the per the imagination that wrote this, yeah, they, that imagination intended it because it speaks in images. It speaks with its whole body. Okay. They live, so he got so excited and all he's saying about, about the fish. They live right in the goddamn ice. Now think about this. They live right in the goddamn ice. Here you go. It's their nature. For Christ's sake. Now think about that sentence. It's their nature for Christ's sake. That's a combining the spirit and na nature. This is very different than the Christ that uh, that you have to not be completely human because you got to be so pure that you don't, you know, do anything that's bad. This is sin. This is, a, this is a very different Christ. This is a Christ that has something to do with nature. They're combined. Okay. They get frozen right in one position for the whole winter. Yeah, what do they eat then? Now, you can imagine Holden asking, this is a very important question, if he's the fish, what do they eat? What am I going to eat? And now and you can all of a sudden think about all the images in this novel that have to do with eating food. What do those nuns eat? What does Holden uh, eat or not eat when he's drinking all of this liquor and not eating at all? Okay, well, so in other words, what am I taking into my body? I'm trying to survive on alcohol right now. What do they eat? I mean, if they're frozen solid, they can't swim around looking for food and all. And is that what Holden's doing? Swimming around looking for food that he can't find because he can't connect with anybody. He can't have communion with anybody. So really Holden's talking about, now I'm not saying what Holden's the character's really talking about, but this novel's talking about, okay? If, in other words, we're connecting Holden to this fish. Because we're identifying, we're using images, and they're metaphorically the same. All right. Now, if we're reading from the neck up, that doesn't work. But if we're reading images, all of a sudden it makes sense. Okay. They swim around looking for food. What do they eat? Then Horvitz says, their bodies, 
for Christ's sake. Look at that word, their bodies. This is telling you what, this is why I'm paying attention to the bodies. This is Horvitz saying the, their bodies for Christ's sake. What's the matter with you? Matter is also something that's in the body, right? It's matter, it's material, it's of the earth. This is what mother means from, from uh, matter for mother is the same word etymologically. It's the matter. Okay, this is nature. Their bodies take in nutrition and all right through the goddamn seaweed and crap that's in the ice. Now, think about the profundity of that. Their bodies actually know how to eat. Now, your neck from the neck up, you don't. Your body does. And look, all of this stuff, even the stuff you think is crap, th there may be nutrition and nourishment in it if you can catch it. Okay, so even the seaweed and crap that's in the ice, weed is something you think of as negative, but there's no negative or positive to, unless you can't hear. You see what I mean? There's nothing naturally negative. There's nothing naturally good or bad. That would be all from the head. Na nature doesn't know anything about good and bad. It only knows stuff about life and death. We come in and we start saying good and bad, but now that's our that's this stuff up here getting disconnected from nature. Nature doesn't have any sense of good and bad. It's all good for nature, even the seaweed and crap. The crap is good in nature. Now, this is why you can see crap all over this novel. It's not just playing, throwing in a curse word. It's suggesting even the crap is part of the natural world. And if you can't accept the crap, then you ain't in nature. All of this in one little back and forth with Horowitz. Okay. He says it, it, it takes in right through the goddamn they got the, here's here here it is right here here it is they got their pores open the whole time their pores open this is what holden has to learn to do open his pores but he's frozen you see he's got to make himself permeable to the world which would mean he's got to come outside of that thing that he's that call you could think of He's got to open his pores to the world again. He's closed them with his the fists, okay? They got to open their pores the whole time, not just when it's positive. The whole time. Even this death is part of this. You, you, you I mean, this is what is this is the inside and the end, right? Those kids are going to grab for the golden ring and they're going to fall, and you got to let them. You can't keep them from falling because that's what it means to be alive. Well, you got to keep your pores open the whole time. Right now, you closed your pores because it hurt. You got to keep them open right now. And guess what? You're not going to die because Mother Nature is going to know how to feed you. You got to trust that something's going to know how to take care of your body. And it won't be just from your neck up. Mother, okay. This is why this book is to the mother, okay? All right. That's their nature. Here it is. You see, this is, he's speaking to Holden now. That's their nature for Christ's sake. See what I mean? Now, you can imagine this, this book asking us. You see what I mean? And probably, I don't know, however many readers, every once in a while, one does. But the only ones that see what, what, what this book means are paying attention in a way that none of the people at Pensy are paying attention to each other. None of the people in these nightclubs are paying attention to each other. In other words, you can't be a phony and read this book and see what Horvitz means. This is why I ask you about us finding each other in literature. Yeah. And, so, and this is what we've been talking about, right, throughout, is this idea of reading the novels with the words in mind, with the imagery in mind, because that's the part where you start to see the connections, um, and, and that's one of the things that we've talked about throughout when I first reread, I, I'm not sure I'd read this book actually in high school. So reading this book the first time through after all of our conversations, <clears throat> I knew I needed to be looking for those kinds of things. And, and it's interesting because I made lots of marks in the book as I went and I got to the end and I was still kind of like, I'm not sure. But after listening to what you've said, even just in this 40 minutes or so, those images are what starts to pull things together. And then you go from a book where I maybe had thoughts of, is this book really relevant anymore? You know, is it, is it so because of when it was written, is it, does it have anything to do with me? It's, you know, it's written by a man. The main character is a boy. There are very few females in it, but then you start looking at those images and the, the, 
start having these conversations about how this is human nature and this is how we relate to ourselves and to each other and how these books say things that are difficult sometimes to say to each other that brings a whole different light to the conversation and it it makes it 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 as a librarian, it makes me feel really good because I'm like, yes, these books are still relevant today to pick, you know, to people today, to kids today, to adults today. Um, if we are reading them with those images in mind, if we are yeah. reading with that open mind. And that's the crucial point, really. It, when people you, you hear people saying all the time, well, that was back good in its day, blah, 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 blah. Well, this is if these are great works of literature, there's a reason for it. But we're not going to know that if as you said, we can't participate in the imagery, which is another way of saying if we're only reading from the neck up, right? If we're just doing this and trying to figure out, okay, that's not, this is the gender is off there. That's not, we don't do things like that anymore. Okay, well, that could be true, and that, but that's true from here up. With the rest of us, there's a lot going on that what we're missing. And if we start to, as you said, not miss it, then all of a sudden, all of these superficial things aren't the criterion if this book matters, speaking of matter or not, this book matters because we can hear it. And he, and this, this is when Holden starts sharing the books that he likes. He likes Thomas Hardy. He likes Thomas Hardy's book, Return of the Native. Now, what we've been talking about with nature. Now, listen to that title, Return of the Native, The Return of the Natural. He's got to get what's native in him has to return. Already, why does he like this book, Return of the Native? One of the characters in the book is Eustacia Vi. Eustacia is a word that means fruitful or bountiful, but it comes from the word Anastasia, which means resurrection. But I don't know that because I'm a walking. I know it because I think this word must mean something if he said Eustacia Vi. He said it twice now. So I go and look up Eustacia. That's how I know it. In other words, you don't have to know these things in advance. You can just you can assume that there's an image involved here. You could pick any book that you like on human bondage. Why Why on human bondage? Well, doesn't this book talk all about mummies? Things that are wrapped up and are embalmed. Their faces are covered. Isn't that like a call? Isn't mummy sound like mommy? I mean, all of these things you don't notice if you're not paying attention to the images. I want to share with just real quickly. This is a, a famous painting. I'm going to do this. Just, just one little image. It's a famous painting by Rene Marguerite. I hope I'm pronouncing the name right. And it's going to really, I think, shed a light on what we're talking about here. Okay, here, this is a famous painting. It's called The Treachery of the Image. And there's the there's an image of a pipe. And then beneath it, it says, C.C. ne pas un peep, which is, I suppose, it means, if I lived in Paris for a year and I learned zero because I was reading literature all the time in English. Anyway, this is not a pipe. Now think about the paradox here. You're looking at this thing and you're saying, oh, I'm looking at a, a pipe. And the painting is saying, no, that's not a pipe. Now, why is that not a pipe? Well, it's not a pipe because it's an image of a pipe. The, the, with the painting in a way, it's called the treachery of the image. The painting in a way is saying, you know, you're looking at this painting, but you're not seeing the painting. You're seeing what you're projecting onto the painting. You're seeing a pipe, but you're not seeing the image. In fact, we could even say there's not a statement there. There's an image of letters that we're calling a statement. Now, this paradox, this paradox is getting to what you're talking about because we can't see the images like we're talking about here, usually because we're taking the words and we're turning them into things like Holden is the name of a person. So we see a guy there. Well, there's nothing wrong with that, except we're missing the image hold in. I read Caulfield. Okay, well, that's the guy's last name. Okay, yes. But if you're seeing an image and not a guy named Holden Caulfield, all of a sudden the, M, the words Caulfield start to speak to you as an image. So this is how literature is different from any other work of literature. It's speaking a language within a language. It's speaking the language of images in English. You can even say... You're reading English, but it's speaking images. When you learn to speak images, now that doesn't mean you just make up a bunch of stuff. You could make up some random sort of theories and try to apply it to the book, but you might miss the book. It just be all in your head. That's a miss. That's a way of misreading. 
people will say, do you think uh, Salinger thought of all those things? Again, I don't know what Salinger thought of. All I know is these images are repeated multiple times. How many times do you say, for Christ's sakes? How many say, times do you say, knock me out? How many times does he refer to a horse? One of the things he finds in Phoebe's books, Phoebe writes a little note to one of her friends, and Phoebe says to her friends, you said you're Sagittarius, but you're only Taurus. Now, this is, he sees Phoebe, wrote one of her friends, oh, why, why that? You look up Sagittarius, what is it? That's part horse, part man. It's centaur. A horse and man, a horse and around. What does he say about, he doesn't really like cars. He'd rather have a horse. At least a horse is human. And at the end of the, the story, isn't Phoebe sitting on a horse, an old beat up horse? It's Phoebe's part woman, part horse. There's the Sagittarius. Her friends said she was Sagittarius, but she's only Taurus. What is Taurus? It's a bull. This book, incidentally, could practically be a zoo if you scratch the surface, the number of birds that are in it. Not, not just birds, the number of animals, period, including birds. Okay, we talked about ducks and fish. We got jaguars. We got deers. It's a deer hunting cap. We got bulls. I mean, every kind of animal in here. Why? Because we're part animal. But we're not all animal. See, if we were all bull, then we'd be all animal. And that ain't what we are either. We've got this weird thing, this imagination. And there's a part about us that's a little bit different. Our nature includes a kind of intellect that other animals don't necessarily have to be uh, deal with. But this same intellect is what can make us disconnected from our nature. We got any, you can see why these, we got to get the natural and the human and the spiritual all working together. If they're disconnected, we're dying. We're not and fully alive. And one of the things that we've talked about with Reading for Life is that idea that, that reading these books in this way and having conversations and with other people about what they're seeing brings so much more to the novel than what you maybe would experience on your own. And that idea that, that reading a novel and discussing the novel in the collective, in the community, brings all of these pieces to to the novel that you don't necessarily bring just yourself. Not that it's not important to read for yourself and on your own, but that collectiveness of building community around what you see in a novel versus what the next person sees in a novel and, and discussing those differences and why those, like you said, there are really no wrong answers. If you see something in a novel and it's in the novel and you're pulling it out of those words, that's meaningful. And that may help someone else create meaning as well. I love that. And you can imagine in an ideal book club, that's what would happen. We wouldn't be competing with who's the smartest and who figured it out and who has the went on the Internet and got the right answers. OK, what we would be doing is what you just shared. I would share with you what my imagination noticed with these images. You would share what your imagination noticed and we would be collaborating. We'd be communing to actually see something, as you said, that we would have never seen on our own. But how many actual book clubs actually work out that way? I, I, as a reader, I know people that really love literature are often the most frustrated when they go to book clubs because they want to talk about novels at this kind of interesting level. But somebody, will, next thing you know, will start saying, you know, Salinger never did want to give an interview. And when he gave an interview, he once sued him that they couldn't use his own transcript. And, you know, and then next thing we're gossiping about Salinger. And then we could talk about, you know, he was maybe he had a weird sex life. Well, all that could be absolutely interesting, but we should say we're not having a book club. We should say we're having a book to talk about Sounder Sex Life Club, and then we should get together and talk about that. We're not really talking about the book. And isn't and isn't uh, Holden making fun of that in a kind of way, too, when, when Carl Luz is the guy, all he wants to talk about is sex, and he doesn't want anyone else to notice something he doesn't notice? This is, in a way, this book is already anticipating you misreading it or you catching it and it catching you one or the other a lot of book clubs you can imagine people get together missing each other because what their personas they're trying now okay, here's one okay go ahead so you thinking of something I was just going to say that that that's kind of one of the things that we wanted to do with this program was create those conversations and our hope is that people will take these ideas 
and, and, you know, bring it up at dinner or they, you know, go out with friends and say, Hey, did you read the catcher in the ride? Did you ever think about it this way? It's that idea of getting those conversations going and having those community conversations. So as we, as we continue to do these lectures and then the podcasts that follow, we break some of those ideas down a little bit more in the hopes that people will um, think about these novels again and maybe pull them out off their bookshelf and dust them off and read them again and have those conversations again. So as I said, we we do these, lect um, these lectures periodically and then we follow up with the podcasts that can be found on the library's website. And um, I think at that point, do you have any kind of closing words or anything for, for the people listening out there today? Well, I, I would just want to say... Uh... This notion that we started out with Holden Frozen, but how does the book end? It it ends with him watching Phoebe on a horse go around. It's raining. He says his hunting hat, his deer hat, was protecting him some, but he still got soaked. Now you can almost see that all that ice thawing, all that ice that was frozen now is coming down as rain. This is, you can say, the moment when he breaks out. He break the moment he breaks down because this is the moment after this that he goes to this place where he's been telling you about this place where madmen go. Okay, he 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 runs out of dough. Speaking of bread and communion, he runs out of dough. But at the same moment that he runs out of dough, he has this breakthrough where he understands that he has to be open. You got to let the kids fall. All the fucks are not going to disappear. Little brothers are going to die. My hunting hat protects me some, but I'm still getting soaked. This is what old Horowitz told him. Open your pores. And guess what? It won't be you saving yourself from being so smart from the neck up. Mother Nature, or you could say Mother Nature for Christ's sake, might actually know what you need to get through the winter. So this novel really comes to a beautiful climax where all that frozen stuff gets the temperature just right. And Phoebe's going around in a circle, which I said Phoebe's comes from Phoebe Apollo. That's the sun has come out and melted the ice. And look, he isn't dead. Something new how, well, we can think of literature as that thing that can catch us when nothing else can. The thing that can bring a kind of rain that we can't find anywhere else. And I love the idea that you've just shared that if we learn how to talk with each other with each other instead of at each other, I think of how many things on TV are the opposite of people finding each other by opening their pores and touching each other. It's either too hot or too cold on TV. And I think these days it's all about being too hot. Here's an alternative way, let's say, to have community. Well, so expiring. Thank you so much. I want to thank Austin Minnesota Library. For, you know, this is an unusual conversations because I don't think often people talk about, we don't pay attention to the images always at this depth, but the very fact that this place in the, in the United States and this library of all places is jump-starting a kind of conversation where we can start to thaw out a little bit and open our pores to each other, and that you have a local a television station that is willing to communicate this to the community, I think speaks highly of the kind of spirit and imaginative sort of wisdom that's alive and well in Austin, Minnesota. Yes, yes. So thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you to KSMQ and thank you to everyone who participated today. And we look forward to talking with you again soon. See you later.